We know that engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good. Right? So, you know, we've all had it where you're feeling a little bit down or feeling a bit lonely. And so you send out 10 texts to 10 friends, you know, hi, 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 hi. Because <laughs> it feels good when you get a response, right? Right? It's why we count the likes. It's why we go back 10 times to see if, and if it's going, if our, my Instagram is growing slower, I would, I, I, did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended, right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it. It's why we keep going back to it. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive. Right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol. And we have no age restrictions on social media and cell phones. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing t chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones. What's happening is because we're uh, allowing unfettered access to these dopamine producing devices and media, basically it's becoming hardwired. And what we're seeing is as they grow older, they, too many kids don't know how to form deep, meaningful relationships. Their words, not mine. They will admit that many of their friendships are superficial. They will admit that their friends, that they don't count on their friends, they don't rely on their friends, they have fun with their friends, but they also know that their friends will cancel on them if something better comes along. Deep, meaningful relationships are not there because they never practice the skill set, and worse, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to a device, they're turning to social media. They're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. Right? These things balance. Right? There's nothing wrong with social media and cell phones. It's the imbalance. Right? If you're sitting at dinner with your friends and you're texting somebody who's not there, that's a problem. That's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, face up or face down, I don't care, that sends a subconscious message to the room that you're, not just, you're just not that important to me right now. Right? That's what happens. And the fact that you cannot put it away is because you are addicted. And like all addiction, in time it'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. Right? And so it's like an alcoholic. The reason you take the alcohol out of the house is, we, we, is because we cannot trust our willpower. We're just not strong enough. But when you remove the temptation, it actually makes it a lot easier. But if you don't have the phone, you just kind of enjoy the world. There should be no cell phones in conference rooms. None. Zero. And I don't mean the kind of like sitting outside waiting to text. I mean like when you're sitting and waiting for a meeting to start, Nobody go. this is what we all do. We all sit here and wait for the meeting to start. Meeting starting? Okay. And we start the meeting. No, that's not how relationships are formed. Remember we talked about it's the little things? Relationships are formed this way. We're waiting for a meeting to start and we go, how's your dad? I heard he was in the hospital. Oh, he's really good. Thanks for asking. He's actually at home now. Oh, I'm really glad. That was really amazing. I know, it was really scary for a while. That's how you form relationships. And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience that some things that really, really matter, like love or job fulfillment, joy, love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, any of these things, all of these things take time. Sometimes you can expedite pieces of it, but the overall journey is arduous and long and difficult. And if you don't ask for help and learn that skill set, you will fall off the mountain, or you will, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, and we're already seeing it, the worst case scenario is we're seeing increase in suicide rates, we're seeing an increase in this generation, we're seeing an increase in accidental deaths due to drug overdoses, we're seeing more and more kids drop out of school or take leaves of absence due to depression, unheard of. These are all, this is, this is really bad. The best case scenario, 
the best, those are all bad cases, right? The best case scenario is you'll have an entire population growing up and going through life and just never really finding joy. They'll never really find deep, deep fulfillment in work or in life. They'll just, just waft through life and it'll be just, it's fine. We now have a responsibility to make up the shortfall and to help this amazing, idealistic, fantastic generation build their confidence, learn patience, learn the social skills, find a better balance between life and technology. Because, quite frankly, it's, it's the right thing to do.